I drew a picture of a pair of wings Because I want to fly My mother asked me to explain I said that I would try But I had a dream the other night about flying Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Wolf's Den today. Hello, world. Today, we are speaking with Mr. Ken Tobias in St. John, New Brunswick. Ken, how are you? I'm getting by. I'm, you know, <laughs> everybody's in their, like, their own little den, you know. And I hear you. Now, it looks by the looks of things, you're in your studio there in St. John. Yep, in my studio. This is my, right now, I'm in my kind of my recording studio part. Okay. Uh, they, just outside, I have a little a little art studio where I do my painting. Well, yeah, now, um, that's the other thing. You know, I, I followed your music for years and years and years. 
And then when you came on Facebook, I found out that not only were you an amazing, amazing songwriter and singer and performer, but you can, you. you can paint, man. Well, you know, like when I was in Hollywood, one of the guys said to me, you know, you got to be, uh, well, first of all, when you went to Hollywood, you had to be what they call a, um, how do they put it? Uh, you had to do more than one thing, let's face it. You know, you, you had to sort of tap dance and sing and, and act. <laughs> okay. Uh, so to speak, that's what it was in the old days. Uh, a, a triple, what was it, triple threat, that's what they used to call it. But uh, so in my, <clears throat> I've always been an artist uh, in the sense that I always drew and stuff. I didn't start painting until about 45 years ago. And uh, and when I painted a painting, uh, just because I did it for, for, for my own creative thing, I sold it. And I went, whoa, that's good. That's, that's nice. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I went on to, to just continue with it. And I kept it kind of quiet. Music was always in the front burner. And, uh, but, uh, you know, now that I'm, I'm sort of, I don't want to call myself retired because I sell my paintings, but, uh, and I still record it and record my songs and uh, release them, even though I don't perform. Uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's always good to know what more have more than one discipline. My, one of my spiritual teachers said to me once, you know, when you're when you're painting and you get tired of it, don't sit down. Go over to your instrument and play because the change is as good as the rest and you'll get revitalized because you're you you already have that space open, that creative space that you go to for your all your creativity. It's already open. So vice versa. So I do that a lot of times. I'll finish painting and I'll be tired of standing and whatever I'm doing and I'll come and sit down for a minute I look at my guitar yeah I gotta pick it up and gotta gotta jam it a little bit you know yeah that kind of thing well I, you know my experience has been is with creative people um it's there it's got to come out it's like breathing it's not like you really got a whole lot of choice in the matter I'm a junkie I'm a freaking a creative junkie let me tell you I always tell my friends, if you come to my house, there's not a new painting or a new song, I'm dead. Yeah, either that or you're really sick, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm, even when I'm sick, I tell you, I paint when I'm sick wow. because it takes me away. It takes me away. I For those moments and I'm doing whatever it is, I'm looking at that house behind you on the island there. If I was painting that, I'd be on that island, I'd be in that house or I'd be at, at that corner painting that corner and that's where I'd be. And all of a sudden you find out, oh, wow, I feel a little bit better. The pain in my shoulder has gone away or I just feel a little bit better. Because it's a that psychic energy that you get, that healing energy. My God, it's precious. Now, how old were you when, when, when you realized that that energy was there and that you needed to tap into it? As far as acknowledging it and knowing what it is, uh, I think it was later on. But... Um, that is to say, to know exactly what that was. I mean, I, I've been practicing Eastern philosophy for like 50 something years and, uh, and meditating and, you know, using that as a way to, uh, to be calm and to help to, not only that, but to help to, listen, when you get into music business and like myself, I mean, I, for a few minutes there, I was in the big show. And uh, when you're in the big show and people are saying, man, you're great, you're great, you're really great, 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 and great, great, great. You know, here's my panties, here's my this, throwing them up at you. You know, after a while, you can start reading your own press. And so it's always good to have something where you can go to where you realize, you know, wait a minute, you, you're not. That's, that's not what it is. It's not, that's not what it's about because no matter how much you know, you're like, the more you know, the more you don't know sort of thing. And so, and I mean, I don't, I don't say these things because they're uh, cliches. I mean, I live by them. And uh, I try my best to 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 uh, follow that. So, and my point is, is that that uh, that has helped me to understand. But so, when I got into that, that's that's kind of where I really realized it was an actual energy that I could tap. And I call it in, in psychic energy. You can call it chi. Yeah. You can call it what you want. All I know is that if you don't op if you don't sit there with the pencil and paper down in front of you, even though if you haven't got a tune. If you sit there every day for that half an hour that you give yourself, uh, after a while, the doors start opening and you might get a line 
but you got to keep it up. It's like anything else. You, what you put in, you get out. You know, I always look at that picture of uh, on the uh, in, in the, uh, the Vatican that, that Michelangelo did on the ceiling where he shows the concept of God reaching down, touching man. Well, man is also reaching up to him. And, and so that's it. You don't, you can't just sit there and let it happen. You got to reach out. And then when you reach out, then maybe you'll get help. You'll, you'll do something. You'll open the door. And then you got to keep the door open. And, I, and uh, <laughs> even when I go to bed at night, I say, before I go to bed, I say, please, look, could you take me to the room that's got all the paintings that I was supposed to bring in? For all the <laughs> Here's a little anecdote for you. Back when, when I was in uh, Sing Along Jubilee, and Murray and I were, you know, we sang duets and so on. And Gene McClellan was around, great, great songwriter. Uh, you know, I, I got a song called, I reached up and got a song called Some Birds. And uh, Gene and, uh, and Ann actually recorded it. And, uh, and then I remember I was sitting with uh, Jim Bennett from the show. We were at his house one day and, and Gene called us up and said, hey, I got this new song. Can I come over and play it for you? And, he, and we said, yeah, come on over. He was on his way to go to, to show it to Ann. He came over and he sang and it was Snowbirds. Oh, my. And he sang the tune. And I mean, God, it was really good and stuff. And he said, so, hey, do you want to, do you want to record it, Ken? And I said, no, nah, man, I got my own tunes. <laughs> and, and I thought after it became the big hit that it was, I said, you know, when I reached up for the tunes, <laughs> I just missed it. That's Snowbirds. <laughs> That's no. Yeah, it was right beside the one you got, just, just, just a couple letters away. <laughs> oh, my. But, I mean, you know, like you started out as a draftsman. I was I uh, when in high school because I wanted to be an artist. Yes. Because I tell you, when I first, to be on stage, I was on stage since I've been four years old. I mean, I've been, I've had nothing but show business in my life. Uh, my mother saw me going around in circles, I'll get to the draftsman thing, going around in circles with a clip on my shoe in the piler, and I'm going tick 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 She thought, well, you got some some rhythm. Um, you want to take some tap dancing lessons? And I said, well, whatever that is, sure, I'll try that. I was a little kid. But I was on a show uh, when I was four years old, modeling and singing. And it was it, in St. John, it was an old Zeller's store on King Street and they had a like you know a little stage and stuff and it was 1949 and I still have the letter that they sent me and I still have the photograph. Wow. Yeah it's nice to have it and um and that's when I first was on stage and they paid me a bag of candy and I said <laughs> I, I like this. Yeah I want to do this. <laughs> yeah candy bring me back I'll play for candy every I'll weekend. Candy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh so anyway, uh, uh, that, that, that was really the start of tap dancing. But really what the tap dancing was is really I wanted to be a drummer. I mean, I had this rhythm in, in me and I never turned out to be a great drummer, even though I could, I got good rhythm. Uh, and, but it's helped me as a producer, it's helped me with everything, even time getting bands and I knew what they were supposed to do, even if I couldn't do it totally myself. And it helped me because I used a lot of great drummers in my life. Hal Blaine, okay. Hell Blaine. I mean, I look back at him and I say, Mike Jowles from King Crimson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, God, I forget his name. Uh, uh, not Hollingsworth. Jeez, um, uh, I hate that, but I forget the guy's name. Anyway, he was playing on the Lawrence Welk show after a while. And uh, but besides that, he was one of the Hollywood uh, drummers. It was just brilliant. God, he was, he was so smart, syncopation to him. Anyway, back to uh, the draftsman thing. So when I was in high school, I, you know, we're doing music. I had a group called the Rambers with my brother. We had our own radio show in, in uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick. And uh, we'd get up there every Sunday morning. We'd do that show. Freddie McKinnon was our bass player, believe it or not. I never knew who the hell he was, but what this great human being was who played bass for us. And then eventually after a while, I got a single. I knew who he was. And we started <laughs> this kind of thing. But we were young, but we were, we were good. We were young, pretty good. And um, I, so when I was in high school, I wanted I wanted to be a, I wanted to be an artist, and I wanted to go to a vocational school, at, which was across town, here to, to study under Fred Ross and those guys who were great artists. And um, but because we were in a very we were not a we started off here as a very poor family, but we 
got middle class a little later on. But my parents could, there, had, there was like $100 a month or something that we had to pay to send me across to another parish at, to go to school. Uh, my dad said, no, you know, 100 bucks buys 17 boxes of groceries, Ken. Okay, dad, I got you. So I just, I took the drafting course. And, I, and, and unfortunately, or fortunately, it was mechanical drafting, not architectural, which is more in the art sense to me. But we had to draw these gears really perfectly and beautifully and whatever. So it taught me perspective and taught me uh, how to put my uh, hands to work, so to speak. And I just bided my time until I could get out and go to music. And then when I finally left home in St. John and moved to Halifax, I got a call. Actually, it was through Patricia McKinnon who, uh, God bless her, Christian Ann, she, uh, Catherine McKinnon's sister, she uh, uh, she was on this Hootenanny show we were in Dartmouth. And me and, and my boys, the Rambers, we played it and won it. And uh, I had a tape with me from the show we had our own CBC radio show. Of course, the tapes were done really well uh, and um, good microphones, good recording. And so I had that and I gave that to her. I said, can I give this to you for, for music opera, Sing Long Jubilee, which was on at the time. She said, yeah, I'll do, I'll do it. And so she sent it out and got a hold of Manny Pitson, who was the director. He said, yeah, I like it. So he called me and he sent me a letter. He says, you got to come down, but we, we, won't have, we can't use you yet, but, but we'll use you as we come along, but you got to come down and get ready. So blah, blah, blah. So I had to get a job. So the first job I got was at the uh, Nova Scotia Hotel where I became a bus boy. <laughs> I, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's another story. And, uh, but then again, then I thought, well, maybe I should try to be a draftsman. I, I got this, some skills. So I got a, a job with Canadian British engineering consultants. And I, I did that for six months and I didn't use any of my drafting skills at all. All I had to do every day was fill, it was town planning and I had to fill in these vellum sheets and put and so they could layer them. And so show the different town planning things underneath. I, uh, every day, uh, I, 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 and so I'd come in, I'd come in like a half an hour late and all the engineers would see me come in. I'd creep in and try to get to my drafting desk because that night, and they'd already read the paper because that night I'm playing at the privateer at all these different clubs and staying up till you know, two in the morning. <laughs> yeah. I was late to get in. So, uh, and that's when I think uh, uh, McLeod had the, the, McLeod, I forget his first name. Good guy. He had the, uh, uh, the um, newspaper, uh, about town sort of a column and he would put me in it all the time and then uh, and they'd read it and they never said anything to me and then one day oh my god this is this is brilliant one day Dexter callback who was the elite head engineer calls me into his office and I'm just waiting around for Singalong to call me and uh, or somebody to call me to go and read and he calls me in his office and he said Ken he says um uh we think you have certain um uh, um, skills, let's say, personable skills, and uh, we'd like you to take over uh, a liaison ship between us and uh, what was the name of the town? One of the, one of the towns in, in Amherst, Amherst, Nova Scotia. They were doing town, a change in town planning and building stuff, and we want you to be a liaison with uh, the mayor for us. But you got to move to Amherst and you got to stay there, and so on. And I'm sweat, starting to sweat blood. I'm going, oh my God, I can't do that. Uh, I can't do that. I mean, God, I, that's just, I'd be seriously ensconced in, in that whole life. And I, that was not really where I wanted to go, but I know it was going to be excellent money, but that's where I would have got. That's that for, but for the grace of God, where I would have gone. And uh, using hardly any drafting skills, I probably would have been more of a, I don't know what to call it, uh, 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 relation town planning relations i don't know what that's called anyway i said listen <laughs> thanks a lot i really appreciate this uh this offer i mean i really appreciate it but you can see i'm sweating i said i said music is my goal and i said i'm just waiting to get on television he said i know we've been reading the papers and um i said i really apologize for coming in late all the time no no we understand we we'd like you you know or something you know it's real nova scotia guy and a uh, real down homer and so it wasn't any more than a couple of weeks later, I got the call to come to, to join, the, uh, you know, to do music hop first. And uh, so they had a little party for me and gave me these cufflinks with the little, with little uh, music notes on them. 
it was like a, a cool party. And that was it. That was the last I ever had a job. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you, you don't have a job anymore because you've been doing what you love. So it's not work. It wasn't, wasn't a job. It's never been a job. Yeah. So now, okay, so you're doing all this stuff. You got the Ramblers going on. You're doing Sing Along Jubilee. Then you got the Music Hop. Well, Music Hop was first. Okay. okay. And then all of a sudden, you get a call from the Righteous Brothers. Now, uh, how did that come about? What happened first is I was in Halifax, and I put together a group called the Book of Tobias, which was a, a songbook okay. of Tobias, my music. And Robbie McNeil from Nova Scotia, Robbie McNeil played guitar with me, and Mike Way, who eventually joined the Bells, which had the big hit Stay a While, which I wrote mm -hmm. later on. So Mike and I were, Mike was in the Ramblers with me, but he didn't know what to do when he left St. John's. What are you going to, you're taking off. What am I going to do? I said, stop playing banjo. I'll teach you how to play the bass and you can be my bass player. And we go out as a duo and you play bass. I'll play guitar. And we got ourselves a, a show. And uh, he said, okay. So I've taught him the basics of bass and he bought himself a Hagstrom and a little bass mate. And away we went down to Halifax along with me doing music hop. Music hop I did twice. I did Sunday Me by Janie Americans because I could sing fairly high and I did that tune. And then we, I did Sounds of Silence with uh, um, Davey Wells, God rest his soul. And uh, it was great. And um, then they called me up to sing Long Jubilee as a, as a, in the chorus. And then eventually, because I, I could sing and write, Brian O'Hearn, who now has the Order of Canada and the Queen's something or other, and then Halifax, the big guy, he uh, he saw my talents, and uh, we he formed a group called the Bad Seeds. I joined the group with him, played drums in the beginning, but really on, we were really a recording group like the Beatles, and um, and then on the show he because he was music director he said yeah I want to do some of your tunes, so we did my songs. God Almighty, I can't believe it at that age singing my own songs on a national television show, which was the second number second uh, known second to, to Don Messer in Canada. And uh, that's what started. That's why Ann did my song, Snowbirds, and we sang duets together, blah, blah, blah. But we're playing around Halifax. I played the Black Knight Lounge, played the Tribe Tears, all these various places. Now we get to the point of how I got to Montreal. A guy by the name of Don Stevens was down in Halifax. He was uh, putting a band together in Montreal. And he saw me and, and the group playing, and he said, listen, I'd like to... We, I, I like what you do. I know what you got. Would you like to come to Montreal and help me form this group? And I said, well, yeah, see, I need, I needed new vistas. I mean, I was just, just like when I fish, fish, I, I fish a brook. I can't stay in a brook very long. I got to see around the next bend. I got to go there. I, I, I can't, I just got to keep going. And that's the way I've been in my life. I can't look behind. I keep going. <laughs> and uh, that's a perfect example of it. So he said, uh, would you like to come to Montreal? I said, okay. So I said, Mike, you want to come with me? Because Robbie wanted to stay in Halifax. So, so we took off. And because I was still doing sing along, we did it in the summer season. We did it in the summer, recorded it for, for the year. And I, so I went up in the summer and took off to Montreal for the rest of the winter. And, um, and I, contrary to all the other guys, I had a few bucks in my pocket from sing along. And so we got a place up there and we formed a group called the Crystal Staircase and recorded two songs. And, um, and I got a manager named Kevin Hunter. So that's how it started. He also managed the five bells and the five bells were like a, a really good, re, very good uh, uh, cruise ship group, blue blazers, white pants, really good. They were very good, but they were, they're kind of square. And, uh, and he, and they were doing big, he made a lot of cash off them. He was one of those guys with a black shirt and a white tie. You know, he was still kind of not underworld, but he, he had, he was used to, he called a 150 bucks a yard and a half, you know, so he had all that sort of stuff going on. And he played all those clubs, which were mafia owned and stuff. So we all, we worked those clubs. Anyway, um, we also played a place called Cafe Andre, which was something else. That's where the Crystal Staircase played. Anyway, he also managed me privately. One day he calls me up and he says, Ken, the Righteous Brothers are in town. Or no, not the Righteous Brother. Bill Medley's in town, and he's doing a show at the Copa. I called him up. I got a hold of his manager, and he said, "If we're not, if we're down there in, in five in five or ten minutes, he'll listen to me." Meanwhile, I just lived up the street on DeRoche, like I mean, literally a running distance 
from the from the hotel he was at. So he, it was winter, so he came up and got me. We ran down the street. I'm holding my guitar. We're running down the street till we get to the to the hotel. We go in, elevator up, knock on the door, <sighs> you know. And to the door comes this guy by the name of Michael Patterson. And Michael Patterson is the keyboard player on all the Righteous Brothers stuff you've ever heard. And uh, he's also Billy's road manager and, and music director. And... Uh, He's standing there in this beautiful tuxedo top with the whole thing and his in boxer shorts. And his nice shoe, nice shiny shoes on with those and those uh, socks held up with that elastic thing they wear. Because in show business, you don't wear your pants yet because you'll wrinkle them. So they were just never getting ready. They were gonna go out and they put, you know. So he says, Oh, you're here. <laughs> and uh, he said, Well, come on in. He's a nice guy. I, I love the guy after a while, we became good friends. And he said, uh, so, okay, uh, so play me a couple of songs. So I played him a couple of tunes and he smiled at me. And then he went over to the phone and he called Bill, who was in the next next room. He says, Bill, you got to come in and hear this, this, this guy. <clears throat> so Bill came over, walked in. To this day, he's the nicest man I ever met. The coolest guy, the nicest guy, and, and uh, sweetest person uh, and talented man. You know, he says... Uh, He's, he called me Kenny. Hi, Kenny. How you doing, Kenny? And uh, I said, he said, so, so play for me. So I played him a couple of songs. He, without thinking, he just looked at me and says, how would you and your manager like to be my guests at the Copa tonight? And I said, Jesus, you know, as a Pope. Oh, man. You know, Catholic, you know. And, and uh, so we went to that night to the, to the show. And we, we had prime seats in the front. And Jesus, in the middle of the show, he stops and he puts the spot, they put the spot on me and he goes, stand up. I got this new young up and coming Canadian songwriter, singer, blah, blah, blah. And he started to, it's not who you are, it's who you're with. That's what I learned in Hollywood. It's not who you are, it's who you're with. And that's what he did. He was, his association with me gave me, gave me uh, credentials. So I, I stood up and I went, yeah, wow, this is cool. Wow, this is really nice. So after the show, and this is one of the greatest moments of my life. Bar none. This is a guy after the show was over. And it's also on a whole mystical level. I got to tell you, I tell this to a couple people and they said, really? I said, there's a mystical thing going on here. Everybody left. And there was, there was this, this worker and he was cleaning the floor. And I was sitting down and Billy went up to the stage and he went to the piano and unhooked his tie. And he sat there and he started to play a little bit. And the guy said to me in my head, he said, in my ear, he says, who the hell do you think you are? You think you're going to be with that guy? This guy was slamming me. He was like putting me down. And, you know, what the way I look at it is the dark force is always there trying to take away the light kind of thing. That's the way I look at it. And this guy, this was like the whisper of the dark side going, trying to bring me down. And I just looked at him. I couldn't believe it. And then all of a sudden, this guy just moved, mopped away. So Billy says, come on up here, Ken. Kenny, come on up here. So I went up to him and I stood beside him. This was my test and I didn't know till I finally started to get into it. He says, uh, I'm, I'm writing this song. Tell me, what do you think of it? And of course, in my own head, I said, Ken, if you ever ever told the truth in your life, it's time to tell it now. Even if he says, get the freak out. So he, to so he, he played and I said, I told him what I felt about it. And he just turned around on the stool and looked at me and says, how'd you like to come to Hollywood? Bad. I just, you know, there it is. And I went, that, that started it right there. That was the big, the big time right there. It started it. Wow. The, the beat goes on, but that's, that's the, how it's, how it started. And it's funny. <laughs> it's funny how one moment changes the whole course of the way your life is going. Yep. Ironically, I have a person, a biographer, doing a book on my life now, my musical life. And the other day they got in touch with Bill Medley. <clears throat> and uh, he was kind enough, actually, to come to, the, to, to come to the phone and talk to her and give her, a, you know, this kind of stuff. And he says, look, tell Ken to call me. Here's my, ad, here's my phone number. Here's my email address. Tell him After all these years, he wow. was still open and kind. Whereas there's other artists that I know who are big and I was friends with who were, you know, like, you know, they were kind of, you know, like I said before, 
you know, you can tell who your friends are who are cool people in your life. Not that they're all bad, and I don't mean it that way, but, you know, so soon they forget, you know, as they say. Yeah, um, it's funny sometimes when the light goes out, how many people go away that are there when the light is shining. But, um, you know, I, I agree with you, though. I think that at the end of the day, you know, we know who the people are that bless us in our lives. And um, the way I look at it is, is I'm going to be me regardless. And if, you know, you can live with that, that's fine. If you can't, that's something you got to deal with because I can live with me because I know that in my heart, I'm just going to do the best that I can do for people. And after that, it's up to them. Well, you know, that's honest. That's, I have to tell you that I tell this to everybody in any interview. I said, you know, when I was in Hollywood or anywhere I was, but specifically Hollywood, when I was at parties where like, if I, I'm not going to name drop, but people are there, you go, you could go, holy shit, look at that. Look at, oh my God, you know, blah, blah, blah. I used to walk in there and go, okay, Ken, in my mind, I go, you remember who you are? I used to say, remember that you're from St. John, New Brunswick, Ken? And he used to settle me. Remember who you are. Yeah. You're from St. John, New Brunswick. You're just a maritime guy. It's okay. Keep that happening. And you know, everybody liked me. I, yeah. And I, I don't mean that in an in ego sense or not, but people like me because I was down home, down to earth. Whereas d- down there, I mean, there's a lot of people who jive you. Like, you know, I don't want to say bad things about anybody, but, you know, I mean, when I first got to Hollywood, I was hang- I hung out with Mac Davis. God bless his soul. I think he died recently. He wrote in the, in the ghetto and memories for Elvis and stuff. And at the time he had written them, but he had, the, Elvis hadn't recorded them. We met, we hung out a while and we did, went out for a little while, went to some places and stuff. Again, I'm not slamming him. He wasn't a bad guy, but in the way he treated women was not, you know, yeah. the way he taught it wasn't my way, you know, it's just, well, and so and so, forth, you know, this. So I didn't hang out with him much after that, you know. Well, <laughs> maybe I should have. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. You know, I, I, I always say that, you know, there's, there's nothing out there that's worth giving up who I am for. You know, yeah, you know, it's the same thing as stealing. You know, there's not anything in this world that's worth putting thief behind my name to have. You know something? I, 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 I wouldn't take a pencil out of someone's office. It was there. I wouldn't grab a pencil unless I asked for it. It just, I, it's not it's just the way I was raised. It's just, it's not yours, you know? And, uh, and, and, you know, there's something, even though nobody's going to say anything, it's just the way you, know, if you want it, Hey, can I have that? Yeah, you can have it. Yeah. I mean, like the worst thing they can do is say no. And at the end of the day, if you're looking for a pencil and they say, no, well, it's not a big deal. Go buy one, you know, you know, exactly. You know, but I I'm with you. If, if it doesn't have your name on it and it doesn't belong to you, you didn't come in with it, then you shouldn't be going out with it, period. I did it once when I was in uh, grade school. I was walking home and I don't know why. There was a bicycle laner. I picked it up and got on it and drove away and got home to my house. And, my, and I don't know what I was going to tell my parents. I said, they said, where'd you get the bike? I said, I don't know. I picked it up and just drove it home. And what? You better take that back. So I took it back. And when I got home, my father... Now, my father was really excellent and I have nothing bad to say about his discipline over me. He, everything he did, I remember, and it was true that what he ever did to me, he was right to do it. And he took me in a room and he said, Ken, you know, I, I don't want to do this, but I got to, you got to, this has got to be implanted in you. I said, dad, it's okay. I did, I understand. I did something wrong. So I remember him taking a belt and just hit me three times. And it hurt a little bit because he was a muscular man. And, I, and he said, I can't do it anymore. I said, that's okay. I, I get it, Dad. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I never did it again. And I remembered it. You know, and in those days, you know, your parents could give you a little bit of a lick and, you know, it was okay. Oh, but, I, I, I got a few. And my, yeah. father, and my father my father was okay with it. Now, mind you, he never, ever hit me in anger. And he never, ever hurt me. And he never, that's my part. And he never ever hit me any place on my ass. And I think, I don't know who cried more. Him or yeah, that's I know to me, <laughs> you know. But at the same time, you're right. When it's all over with, there's a message there. It wasn't you know I'm going to beat your ass and I'm going to perform violence on you. It's you know what you need to learn that you can't do that. There's consequences. There's 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 right. there's things that happen when you do something. There's an opposite reaction for your action. Well, see, we we're born poor on Prince Edward Street, literally like poor. Twenty-five dollars a month was my parents paid for the rent, cockroaches, you know, but they kept us spotless and whatever. And 
because I was born uh, 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 as, a, as a mongrel to a point I had, uh, my father was Lebanese and, and my mother was English Scottish in Beaver Harbor from, she was a son of a fisherman. And uh, so we did both. And although the fisherman side, they really had, were skeptical about the Lebanese side because they, they, you know, they were, I wouldn't call them racist. They were just kind of, they didn't really like anything that was different than them. Leary, they didn't know it. So they were a little bit afraid of it. Yeah, until my father worked in the boats with them. Yeah. And worked hard. He was lifting the hogs heads up. And <clears throat> my brother and I worked in the factory for the Connors brothers, boxing the, the sardines. And mom was cutting the fish with her, 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 her mother and on that side. You know, but we were raised more ethnic, raised more on my father's side. And I got the sting of racism in the very early in, in my, my career. I know what it's like. I got to slap across the face and call the little, the names. But, uh, you know, and, uh, but our parents, when they went home, my father always made sure he says, listen, don't you get angry with those people. And it's almost like Jesus on the cross saying, you know, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And you know something? That's one of the greatest, greatest, uh, bits of, of, of truth that I've ever heard in my life. To be able to say when someone's beating the hell out of you to say, I forgive you because you don't know what you're doing. Because I understand it, really. It's ignorance, not stupidity. It's ignorance. They don't know, so they do it. Yeah. And so, you know, how can you really, in all, and I know it's, I know it's it's kind of like, uh, you could easily say, ah, screw them. They're, they're, they're not good people. Don't hang out with them let them go but in essence you really think about it that's real truth yeah you know that same as do unto others i mean i'm not really a religious guy i'm kind of what i call a spiritual person but all those truths <clears throat> are really true i mean they really really uh, if you it, you can examine them upside down around you can't fault them no no i'm not i'm not what you call a religious person i believe in spirituality and i believe in a higher being but I'm not going to dispute people with what they believe. That's up to them. But I do know one thing, that the better I treat people, the better people treat me. It's the truth. It works that way. And to those who don't, I forgive them. I walk away. I don't yeah. hang with them. You know what? I, I, I end my shows all the time telling people to be nice and to be kind. And I tell them it doesn't take very much to do any of those things. You know, it, it it takes more energy to get angry and to get mean and nasty at somebody than it does to just smile. And I mean, hey, you know, at the end of the day, they've got to live with themselves. So if they're just being a dink and a jerk, you're you're lucky because you get to walk away. You know, something that's an awful weight on your shoulders when you got revenge, when you got all this stuff inside you. I mean, it's a, you're carrying a weight. I mean, it's just forget it. Yeah. You know, it does. It hurts you worse than it hurts anybody else. Exactly. I, I, I never had a really, really, really strong, good relationship with my father. And there was a lot of anger there. And, and I'm going to tell you something for a lot of years, it wore me out. And, you know, it's like holding a hot rock. He didn't know. And he didn't really care. I was the one that angry and I was the only one that was getting burnt and was using up all my energy. Now I'm That's just, right. I'm just happy to be here. Uh, peace to you, man. <laughs> peace to you too. Listen, my friend, I want to thank you so much. I, I, you know what? I, I gotta say, I, I don't really think we're done here. Um, I, I would really like to be able to, um, to take this even a little bit further. Maybe not right, right away, but within a very short period of time, I would like to continue this. I'd like to go a little further. Um, I've just, this has just been an absolute pleasure for me. Me too. I've been really enjoyed our conversation. It's because it's, that's what it's been. It's not. It's been a conversation, not really an interview. And I, I, not that I mind interviews, but this was, you know, like two guys meeting and talking. That's what I like. Yeah, and I, I, I tell people when they ask me about my show, I said I'm sorry, but I don't do interviews. Interviews involve questions that have specific answers, and I don't have any kind of an agenda. I would just assume this be a show where you get to say what you want to say and um, we get to make it your hour and to let people know just a little bit more who Mr. Ken Tobias is. How much time do you have left? Uh, we've got about another five or 10 minutes. The reason I, I, I'd like to ask you, you know, how did the Wolf's Den come about? Um, the Wolf's Den came about because a guy named Eldon McKeegan wanted to interview Ross Nielsen at the Kempshore Music Festival. And he said he wanted to do it for his blues show at CIOE Radio. And I asked him where that was. And he said in Lower Sackville. And that was like, and when he told me the address of it, it was like, 
oh, maybe two minutes away from my house. And people have told me my whole life that I should be doing radio. They said, I, I have the perfect face for it. So I said, you know what? I'm going to give it a go. So I went in and I talked to Jim Robson, who was the head of that CRTC at one time, and to another man by the name of Al Hollingsworth. And um, I went in there with the intent to do voiceovers and to do some commercial work for them. But I had just started within the year or two. Well, no, I'd probably been emceeing the festival at the Kemp Shore for four or five years by then. And um, they said, well, you know, all kinds of East Coast artists, would you do a show where you, where you uh, interview them? And I've always been up for a challenge. So I said, yes. And I took it. And um, we would show, have, the air, show would air on Mondays and I would tape on Thursday. And after every Monday show, I would pray that I would have somebody in the seat on Thursday for the next Monday. And now, um, thankfully, the music industry has been so gracious and wonderful to me now that I can, I have a, a book full of people that I can call to come on. Cool. I, I was, you mentioned the blues. I, I see the CMAs have dropped the blues category. Yeah, I guess they must not have gotten enough um, entries, which I really don't understand because Elmore's Blues came out this past year, I believe, with Wayne Nicholson and John Campbell John. Um, Miles Goodwin, I believe, has got another blues album out. Um, uh, there's a half a dozen that I can think of right off the top of my head here in the Maritimes. So I don't really know what happened. I don't know whether they didn't apply or what, but yeah, it's kind of a sad situation. Yeah, that's kind of, because the Maritimes has been known as a blues place. I mean, not just because of Dutchie, who's like an old friend of mine. Uh, but before that, I mean, there were all kinds of blues oh, players around. And we still do. I mean, you know, well, Garrett's still kicking around and we've got Shrimp that's Daddy. Cool. You know, and the sharpshooters, um, uh, we got Kendra Gale up in New Brunswick. We got a beautiful young fellow over in PEI, Logan Richard. Um, we got a band over in St. John's and, and their name right now eludes me and I'm, that upsets me. But, um, but yeah, so there's lots of blues going on. Yeah, man. Cool. You know, I mean, there's lots of music. People are saying there's no music going on in that. Look, uh, I, I'm sorry, I have to disagree because uh, I'm getting new music every single day. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, uh, I don't know too much about the ECMAs. I, <clears throat> I've only done a couple of song circles with uh, people who have been in ECMAs, but they haven't talked to me much. I don't know much about them. But now, um, so right now you're, you're pretty much, you're, you're pretty, got your hands pretty full looking after your mom. And well, yeah, that's, I've been doing that for, uh, for 17 years. I came down from Toronto when, uh, 17 years ago, 2004, to take care of her. She just had had enough by being herself. And I, I felt it was hard for me to leave her TO. At the same time, I felt, well, maybe, you know, it's time to go. And, and maybe, well, first of all, I was ex expendable as far as Toronto. I, my other two brothers were so ensconced in different kinds of businesses. Whereas I knew if I just needed an airport and uh, I could still go out and play and, and get my musicians and so on and so forth and go do it, which I did. Um, but now it's been 17 years. And so what happens is I, I have my own recording studio here. I do all my own recording. And, and uh, because I've been a producer and a player a bit, um, I'm able to do it and, 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 and they sound like real records and so on. So I, I master them here and put them out. We put out one or two a year and put them up on, on Spotify and these other places. We don't really release them uh, on radio and so on and so forth. I just put them out. And um, in my pile of songs on, on these various places and they stream. And I also, I still receive royalties from from all the various publishing companies I've been with and for all the songs that are out there. God, I have probably 300 songs registered at SOCAN. Wow. And uh, it's a lot, of, a lot of tunes. And since then I've written, right now I've got probably 30 songs in the can I've been, I've written since the fifth, uh, since five, about five years ago that have never been heard. Wow. And, yeah. It's kind of cool. <laughs> I, I just go back and listen. I, and even then, see, first of all, I am a songwriter who actually could sing, but so I just did whatever I did. I wrote whatever I wrote. And that's another reason why I never could get labeled and the record companies hated me for it because you know, they wanted somebody like, let's say a James Taylor, who like, you, you hear James, you know, every song is going to be sort of a James Taylor song. Yeah. Where I'm writing a tune that is like, you know, a fusion tune 
all of a sudden it's a jazz blues tune, all of a sudden it's a folk tune, all of a sudden it's a rock tune, and et cetera, et cetera, whatever I wanted and felt like I wanted to do. I remember my, my album with uh, the one I did uh, with Every Bit of Love and those songs on it. We had four hits off that, four radio hits. And then I had a tune on there called Save the Forest, which was like six minutes long. And the record company guy said, why'd you put that on the record? I said, wait a minute. I'm an artist. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, believe in, I believe in stuff. I had a and six I, minute song that I believed in. So I'm putting it on there. I don't care if it doesn't get any radio play. Yeah. You know, and funny thing is, on my shows, people came to see that song because yeah. it was we, we had great musicians and, and it, it was a cool tune and they dug that tune. Yeah. As long and, as, you know, as well as a hit, you know. And you've even done spaghetti westerns. <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Salad de, de large. Huh? One, yeah. One of the greatest, one of the greatest, Silver Saddle. One yeah. of the greatest, uh, another one of the greatest moments of my life. I know you haven't got much time, but 1978, I went over, I, I paid my own way to, to Medam. Are you familiar with that? No. Medam is, is like the, the, the international marketplace for buying and selling material for all other markets. Wow. So my records over here would be on Attic Records or something. And then over in Italy, they'd be on Chinavox Records. And so you had to go make a deal to get them over there. And they, they were exclusive for you. So when I was there, I was the only, at that time, because I paid my own way, I was the only Canadian music artist there. So they treated me like, you know, like a king. And I got the, I got the, the Canadian booth and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I, I ran into the people from Chinavox Records out of Rome. And they said, my God, Madonna, you're here. Well, you must come to Rome and, and we'll do promotion for the records while you're in here. So anyway, they, geez, they gave us a car and a, and a driver. We drove all the way down from Cannes, France, down through and all through the little towns and all the beautiful villages and stayed overnight and, ate the food and got to Rome. And then I'm in Rome and uh, they said to me one day, they, they played me a song that was gonna be in, a, in one, of their, one of their movies. Shinovox Records, the father, the Bixio, was the first guy to put sound to picture in Rome. Wow. That's how their family was old. Anyway, so he said, listen to this, we're very proud of it. And they played it for me and I went, oh my God, who wrote the lyrics? Who translated the lyrics? They said, well, we had a guy do it up and from who's doing English up in Sweden. I went, well, he didn't get the American English right. And I, then I went, oh, my God, did I insult my, my hosts? They left the room. And I said, oh, God, what did I do? And they came back in the room and they said, Mr. Tobias, he said, we, uh, I'm the kind of Daisy with a beard. I had a beard at the time. And uh, they said, we're doing a movie called Silver Saddle. Would you be interested in writing the lyrics? To the music and sing the lead in the music. <laughs> I said, "Are you kidding?" But boy, that was the hardest thing I ever did in my life, boy, because I, I had nothing but a guitar and and a little tape recorder with this guy singing in Italian, you know. And I mean, I could hardly get the melody, and I had to write lyrics, and I had to be a professional. I was nervous, and um, so we did it, and then I got to sing the tune and in the movie and. Anyway, with one of the greatest directors of, of, of Roman history, you know. Wow. Well, that's how that oh, my goodness. Like I said, look, you know what? I, I, I honestly and truly, I don't think we're near done here. I, I would love so much to continue this conversation with you and, and, and to get just to another bit, just to take from where we're at now and to bring us up to the future at, at least one more show, if you, if, if you could do that for me. Whatever you want, and I'm, 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 I've enjoyed this very much, and it's, uh, it's just what it's fun, you know. Yeah. So sure, I'd love to do it, and and I also really enjoy talking to you, man, and and meeting you. I enjoy that. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for stopping by the Wolf's Den today. Tune in to CIOE Community Radio anytime you want to. We're going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Please, if you're following this on the internet. Go right now down and hit that subscribe button, ring that little bell, hit that notification bell so you don't miss any more videos. And we'll see you back here next week on The Wolf's Den. And remember what we always say, please be kind, be nice, be good to one another. And if you can inside your bubble, hug the ones you love. Don't forget to give a little love. That's right. And you got to give a little love too. Mr. Tobias, sir, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>